from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Welcome, Eric Atkinson here. Coming up today from Oklahoma State University, Daryl Peel offers his insight on the cattle market trends. Among other things, Daryl will look at the dynamics of higher corn prices and cattle finishing at the feedlot and the likely impact on the feeder cattle market moving forward. Also today, K-State's Jamie Lynn Farney talks with the University of Missouri's Jordan Thomas about his research into a different approach to synchronizing beef cows ahead of either AI or embryo transfer. They're calling it the 7 and 7 protocol. And on this week's 4-H segment, Jeff Wickman will talk with K-State's Aliyah Mestrovich C. about the upcoming 4-H Citizenship in Action event. All that and more here on Agriculture Today. A social distancing tip. While the CDC urges you to avoid close contact, like hugging or shaking hands, there are other non-physical ways to say hello. Wave, wink, use sign language, salute, smile, give the peace sign, throw up an air high five, do jazz hands. Remember, stay a minimum of six feet or two arms length away from others and stay home if you can. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part. Because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Glad to have you listening in once again for another Agriculture Today. Starting up the week, as we always do on the cattle markets, we're bringing in now from Oklahoma State University livestock economist Daryl Peel to cover a a selection of things here. Daryl, and looking back at the markets this past week, the cash Fed cattle trade did eventually edge higher as we continue to see at least a firm undertone in these markets. Yeah, that's right. I think, you know, this Fed cattle market is trying to do kind of what it should do seasonally, which is sort of, um, you know, move higher seasonally through the first quarter. And I think we're beginning to see that. It's been a little bit sluggish to get to that point. Uh, We've had plenty of cattle. We've had a need to market cattle on a timely basis. And so that, that has added some some pressure to that market, or at least uh, sluggishness. But I think we're overcoming that now and starting to see a little progress. And we might mention the futures trade showed well this past week likewise. What do you read into that? Well, there seems to be an awful lot of optimism really across the protein complex, but especially in the the live and feeder cattle futures. Uh, I think there's a number of things going on there. Some of it's related to the idea that we are slowly beginning to make some progress on the, the pandemic and rolling out vaccines and and, and moving to a point where maybe we can see food service recover a little bit. Some of it's just the seasonal factors and so on. Uh, but it's doing that in spite of the fact that the higher grain prices is, is also weighing on the markets, especially the feeder cattle market. So uh, it's kind of a mixed bag, but it does seem to have a lot of optimism built into that market right now. We do want to get into the spillover impacts of those higher corn prices in just a second. To round out last week's trade on the boxed beef side, well, it's been a nice run there for a while, but apparently there was a bit of a retreat this past week. Yeah, you know, we had a really strong run through the month of January, which was a good sign coming out of the holidays. You you always wonder, you know, did we move a lot of meat through the holidays and it does look like there was demand to sort of rebuild the pipeline and so on. That said, it's not terribly surprising, I guess, that at this point we're going to take a little bit of breather in that. So we'll be watching it. I'm not overly concerned yet about it pulling back a little bit. I think that's probably uh, really surprising. Uh, but we'll certainly watch it. One of the things that's happening in that market is that we have maintained and continue to maintain a very wide choice select spread. And this is typically the time of the year when we're moving to a seasonal low in that as we get into February, perhaps early March. And so far, we've not done that. Uh, And you can read that uh, several different ways. But uh, to me, the fact that choice is staying high relative to select is probably a good demand sign. So I think uh, in general, I'm, I'm not terribly concerned about this market pulling back a little bit, but we will certainly keep a close eye on it. That is interesting. Choice trading as well as it is. Again, the uh, food service sectors aren't backed up at full snuff, but is this an indicator that, in fact, we are seeing restaurants, etc., starting to get their footing under them again? Well, it may be. It's a little hard to be sure. I think the more time that passes, restaurants have found ways to kind of overcome the challenges to some extent. We still have a lot of restrictions on inside dining, if you will, in a lot of areas. And and it's wintertime, so farther north, it's, you know, it's outside dining is not an option. And all of those are factors. But 
I think that sector is already looking ahead to spring at a little bit better weather mm-hmm. uh, and again more uh, you know more potential for uh, some of the restrictions to be uh, lowering a little bit as we go forward. We haven't talked since the USDA released that semi-annual cattle inventory report last week, Daryl. Your takeaway from that report, again, it showed that there may be a slight contraction in the cow herd. What's your sense of what that report had to say? Well, you know, from my standpoint, the report was pretty close to what I expected. I've, I've sort of been suggesting for a number of months that we were more on a plateau than we were, even though we did peak in 2019 that we weren't really in an active liquidation, and this report would seem to kind of confirm that. So we're sort of drifting lower, uh, but really not a strong sense of direction one way or the other. And if you look at the the beef replacement heifers, for example, was just about unchanged from a year ago. It's at a level that certainly would not suggest contraction, but neither is it robust enough to really actively suggest expansion. And so I think we're in kind of station-keeping mode here in 2021, waiting really for some new sense of direction from the market. And that may come in the second half of the year with progress in a post-pandemic world, or at least mostly post-pandemic world, combined with, uh, you know, probably some recovery in our trade situation. All of those things could stimulate, I think, some strength towards the end of the year. And not in 2021, but perhaps uh, after 2021, we might actually think about growing this herd just a little bit. At least that's one uh, possible scenario at this point. But any such expansion or growth will be pretty slow in coming. Yeah, that's right. I, it's you know we're we're just kind of uh, you know again sort of maintaining where we are and sort of waiting for new news. So mm-hmm. and obviously you know it could go the other way, but it would take some big new negative factor I think to change the situation on that side. So uh, yeah, we're kind of in wait and see mode right now. Well, what is most interesting among everything right now? those high corn or feedstuff prices and how the cattle sector is responding. Well, for one thing, this may have an effect on feeder placement weights as we go on down the line. You actually discussed that in a recent article. Tell us more about that relationship. You bet. You know, uh, when we see these high, you know, high feed prices, high corn prices, we know it's going to raise the cost of gain for the feedlots. And so, and, you know, I like to point out to people that, High corn prices doesn't mean that we're not going to feed cattle. The feeder cattle are out there. This year's supply of feeder cattle is already on the ground. So those cattle are going to come through the system. They are going to get fed. But for the individual feedlots, they're, you know, they're making decisions every week about, you know, basically, uh, do I want to buy pounds or do I want to put more weight on uh, lighter weight cattle in the feedlot? And obviously, as cost of gain goes up, they're going to be more interested in buying some of that weight from the country, if you will and not uh, put as much of that expensive feed in cattle. So we may see placement weights adjust a little bit. That might have an impact on days on feed and a limited effect on uh, final weights as well. And so all of those factors will be playing out, and they really are going to show up in the feeder cattle market as we think about relative demand for different weights of cattle driven by those feedlot decisions will kind of change the way, uh, you know, the price relationships look in that feeder cattle sector. How much pressure could be brought to bear on those lighter weight feeder prices, though, as you crunch the numbers here? Well, there's a number of factors that go into this. You know, one of them, of course, is the overall price level for feeder cattle uh, is likely to be pressured a little bit by high corn prices, at least in an all-else equal world. If fed cattle prices are stable, should happen to be stable, then feeder cattle prices likely get lower with high grain prices. But, again, within that feeder cattle complex, high grain prices would tend to kind of reduce demand for lighter weights uh, relative to the heavier weight cattle. However, at this time of the year, the lighter weight cattle, particularly if you get down there low enough to be thinking about grass-type cattle or, you know, all the way down to the calves, seasonally we're seeing stronger prices. So I don't think we're seeing uh, that corn price effect really showing up in the feeder cattle market yet. But as we go forward, another three, four, five months, then I think uh, we'll con- we will see more of that, that effect get built into this market. These are interesting times, to be sure, with all of these different dynamics going on. Haven't asked you yet about the export scene, which you track very carefully. Are we moving beef in any appreciable way of late? You know, the, the latest data we have was from November. Uh, we don't quite have the December data and, and being able to close out 2020, but the November data was very positive. Uh, after recovering from some volatility and, and some disruptions earlier in the year, 
obviously related to, to COVID-19. But really, very strong exports. And, you know, we continue to see, you know, growth in most of our major markets. And even Mexico, which is one of our major markets that had been severely uh, negatively impacted through 2020, actually bounced back pretty strongly. So that's a good sign that maybe there's some recovery in that market. And we continue to see growth in uh, exports to China. Even though they're a fairly minor part of our total export picture at this point, they grew tremendously in 2020. Uh, and actually, by the end of the year, it looks like they will come in as the number seven market for U.S. beef exports. Uh, you know, our big five are, are, of course, Japan, South Korea, Mexico, Canada, and Hong Kong. And uh, those continue to be there. But China could come on uh, relatively strong in the next couple of years. There are a great number of friendly indicators for these markets. So as you look at this coming week's trade, then, Daryl, what do you think will be the drivers uh, of note in the markets? Well, you know, obviously we've mentioned that the the box beef market is pulling back a little bit. So that, uh, you know, kind of tempers perhaps the, you know, the packer demand for fed cattle. At the same time, this is the time of year when we see stronger prices. Uh, I think we'll hold, you know, steady to perhaps slightly stronger on these fed cattle markets just from a seasonal standpoint as much as anything. And, you know, the the feeder cattle markets, uh, again, we're kind of seeing seasonal moves right now. The lightweight calf prices are are moving higher seasonally, but the big feeder cattle are really kind of near their seasonal low and and have been a little bit soft lately before they'll turn around here in the next, uh, oh, you know, three to four weeks probably and then begin to move higher seasonally with a little bit of delay. All right. Hey, thanks as always for offering your thoughts on these trades, and uh, we'll catch up again in a few weeks. Appreciate it, Daryl. You bet. You bet. Anytime. He is livestock economist Daryl Peel, Oklahoma State University, featured on this week's cattle market segment. In a moment, a K-State beef cattle specialist and her guest will talk up a different approach to synchronizing beef cows ahead of breeding. You're listening to the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. This is Agriculture Today, and tapping into now another podcast hosted by K-State Beef Systems Specialist Jamie Lynn Farney. Weekly, Jamie Lynn talks with cattle production experts about a whole range of topics on this Dr. J's Beef series. And recently, she shared the word on a different approach to estrus synchronization of beef cows for either fixed-time AI or for embryo transfer. And the conversation leans on the research of her guest, Extension Animal Scientist with the University of Missouri, Jordan Thomas. He talks with Jamie Lynn about what's being called the 7x7 sync protocol. Since there are so many synchronization protocols out there, Jordan, why you are looking at improving some of these uh, readily accepted ester synchronization protocols? Sure. Well, you know, I think the first thing I would just touch on why we're interested in in synchronization in general, and that's that by increasing the proportion of females that conceive early within the breeding period, whenever that is, and therefore increasing the proportion of females that calve early in the in the calving season, we add a lot of economic value to, to operations. We really do. And sometimes it changes the, you know, the return structure in a way that I, I think we all get, but it also it also changes the cost structure long term because it really affects how long females remain in the herd. And that affects things like these hidden costs of cow depreciation. And really in a way it affects feed costs too, because now you have a very consistent group of females to manage and you can provide supplementation appropriately to the whole group rather than, than really over supplementing or under supplementing females, you know, based on where they're at in terms of stage of production. So we talk a lot about the returns, you know, and calf weaning weight and all those things are extremely important 
important, but it also really helps with cost control, which sounds like a weird thing to say because it's a cost, right? Ester synchronization is a cost, um, but it really does potentially help with cost control because of what it does to the overall management of the herd. And the other piece of that is, you know, with, with synchronization and, and use of AI, we can potentially reduce the bull power that we really have to provide um, for the remainder of the breeding season. Bulls are a really expensive investment if you think about not only the animal themselves, but the fact that that bull eats, you know, 1.5 to 2 cows worth of feed all year long. And then he uh, is also tearing stuff up all the time. And so that's, that's, a, that's a cost. And, uh, and using artificial insemination to, to really change the cost structure of the operation is really powerful. So that said, you know, if we're, if we're going to do AI, I don't know that getting the maximum pregnancy rate has to be the goal. Um, but certainly for many folks that do want to do, do artificial insemination, they really want to generate, you know, the most pregnancies possible. And so that was that was our initial push really in a lot of the research we do is just how can we make a, a synchronization system that, you know, is relatively inexpensive and is, is still fairly straightforward to use but generates these really exceptional pregnancy rates. So with this protocol in particular, the challenge that we were trying to address is what I call the industry standard protocol, the seven-day cosync plus cedar. Although it's very effective and it's a great opportunity for a a lot of people and a a simple protocol to use, it does leave a little bit to be desired in terms of how it actually controls the estrus cycle. And so that was really what we were trying to get at with this. Let's get into the specific protocol I was wanting you to visit about. And it is one that you've been investigating. It's called the 7 and 7 protocol. What is the protocol? Yeah, so it's it's not a mixed drink. And I think I think that's an important place to start with <laughs> that question a lot. Uh, no, so, so it's we called it that because there's a 14-day cedar protocol that's already out there. This is a very different protocol. And this also involves a cedar being in place for 14 days. And so to avoid the confusion and we thought seven and seven made more sense and and the reason that that schedule is set up the way it is is really partly to be convenient because when you have these handling events that are scheduled exactly one week apart it's a little easier to actually accomplish that so that's part of what's going on but it's really a lot like the seven day cosync plus cedar but it involves one additional handling step a week before that protocol would typically start and so the protocol actually begins with prostaglandin, which is a weird way to start an ester synchronization protocol. And that's, that's why it works the way that it does. But it starts with prostaglandin, and then you place a cedar at the same time. So you, for example, a prostaglandin product like Estermade or Lutilize, one of those products, and then place the cedar. And then seven days later, you give GnRH, and the cedar remains in place. GnRH would be a Fertigil or Factoril or Cisterel, one of those products. Obviously, there's other products as well. But um, a GnRH product, the standard dose of that, the cedar remains in place. And then seven days after that, now on day 14, you pull that cedar and give another dose of prostaglandin. So like an estromate or a lutalis, one of those products. Again, standard kind of dose. So if you think about that, that's a lot. If you're familiar with the seven-day cosine plus cedar, that's actually very similar. It just involves that cedar being in place for an extra week at the beginning of the protocol. And the protocol actually starting with prostaglandin, which I realize is a little bit bizarre to, uh, to folks. Now, in terms of then what you do from that point forward after the protocol, you know, you certainly could heat detect an AI. Our goal with this, though, has really been to develop a strategy that worked well with fixed time AI and would yield really high pregnancy rates with fixed time AI. And so all of our research has either been with a, a fixed time artificial insemination at 66 hours. And again, that's in cows or has been with embryo transfer, which has been a little different thing. I would imagine we probably won't get into that today, but that's our objective is a a fixed time AI system that yields really high results in cows. And so what about your pilot projects? What are some of the results you've seen from use of this 7 and 7 protocol? Yeah, you know, so the the first thing that we did a couple of years ago, I had a a master's student, uh, Rachel Boniker, that did a really nice series of projects. And the first one that she did, we we took um, a couple of different herds in our university system and we did a one of those big, uh, why did I sign on to do my master's with this guy kind of trials because we had five different uh, experimental treatments. And, and just a lot of ovarian ultrasound, a lot of blood sampling, and really wanted to understand the consequences of, of doing what we're, what we're talking about, essentially inducing a persistent follicle in advance of GnRH. You know, it, 
in a way, it sounds like a risky thing to do. And so we wanted to really make sure that, you know, before we ever tried that with large numbers, we, A, you know, didn't think we would see any detrimental impacts, but then also thought that, um, you know, we really needed to understand what's happening at the level of the ovary in terms of their response to a, to a protocol like this. And so it was, it was very interesting to have that level of intense data on a, a couple hundred cows before we ever took this out to the field. Um, because what happens is as a result of administering that prostaglandin and, and treating with a cedar in advance of, of GnRH in this treatment schedule, you end up with the majority of cows having follicles that, that we would consider to be GnRH responsive or LH responsive, you know, capable of actually responding to that GnRH when you give it. And so that was the really encouraging thing from the, the pilot work that we did. And of course, we had some pretty promising pregnancy rates and, and rates of heat response, and then took that out to the to the field. And and so Rachel uh, deserves a lot of credit for for doing not only that big project, but, but then another big project that was more of a, a field trial with embryo transfer, actually trying to look at this protocol as a tool to set up recipients in a way that might uh, might yield some improvements. And it did, in fact, yield some improvements. Um, one additional step that we've done in the last in the last year or so has been to to wrap up a large field trial across multiple states and multiple producer herds looking at this protocol with fixed time AI and actually using both conventional and sex semen and comparing that to results with the standard seven-day cosine plus cedar also with either conventional or sex semen. And so really exciting um, results from that. In, in controlling the ester cycle this way with the seven and seven sync protocol, you have a little bit more uniformity among those cows. And so we get a lot of cows expressing esters in a really tight window of time. And as a result of that, um, if you look at, you know, the proportion of cows that actually came in heat in that field trial before the time of a fixed time AI, with our seven-day cosync plus cedar, what I would call a very good heat response, 64%. Uh, but with the seven and seven sync protocol, we actually had an 82% of cows express estrus before the time of fixed time AI. So that's really remarkable. And if you if you use if if you do use this protocol or try it out in a group of cows, just be prepared for that because it, you will typically have a very very high heat response in comparison to what you might be used to. And of course, that translates into in general it translates into some good pregnancy rates. Yes, and you know, for most of the folks listening on this podcast, you're you're interested in it from the the fixed time AI part. From you've kind of mentioned it a few times that I've been hearing. You like it for ET work or embryo transfer work because you are getting that tighter window on your cows. Absolutely. You know, so for recipients for embryo transfer, a couple of things really make them high quality recipients. One is if they express estrus versus don't express estrus, you can still generate some pregnancies among cows that don't express that standing estrus behavior. And then the other piece of, of that that's favorable is just that defined window of time part. You know, it, whenever we have variation in when cows express estrus, we introduce some complication from a management standpoint. And so that's the case with embryo transfer for sure, because we really need to match the stage of embryo development with the stage of the estrus cycle that the, the recipient is actually in at the time that embryo is placed. So this, this protocol is really nice and a lot of our practitioners really appreciate it for embryo transfer because of the fact that A, you get those really high quality candidates and, and a lot of them, but then two, it, it really simplifies the, the management of embryo transfer just because those candidates express estrus in a pretty narrow window of time. University of Missouri animal scientist Jordan Thomas, along with K-State's Jamie Lynn Farney there, take in more details on this 7x7 cow synchronization protocol from the full podcast. Simply go online and search for Dr. J's Beef. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128 plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers, dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. You're listening to Agriculture Today, coming to you from the campus of Kansas State University. Eric Atkinson here. Now today's agricultural news headlines for you, courtesy in part of DTN. 
Agricultural producers are expected to receive higher cash value for crops and livestock here in 2021, but direct government payments will fall this year, leading to an overall 8% decline in net farm income for the year. This according to a USDA projection released on Friday. This early 2021 farm income forecast by the department also coincided with a monthly and annual update on trade data from the Census Bureau. We'll get into more of that in just a second. Looking at the USDA income forecast, net farm income is projected to drop $9.8 billion here in 2021 after jumping $38 billion in 2020. Overall, net farm income then expected to come in at $111 billion in 21. The lower net income tied to a projected 45% drop in direct government payments as producers see higher sales for their products at the same time. This forecast is showing a dip in 2021 net farm income, also boosting the 2020 net farm income from the December projection by $1.6 billion. 2020 net farm income at the highest level since 2013 at $121 billion. Overall, the USDA is projecting both crop producers and livestock producers will see higher farm cash receipts in 2021. Crop producers seeing an $11.8 billion boost in cash receipts. That would be up nearly 6% from 2020. The largest boost there coming from higher corn and soybean prices, of course. Livestock producers expected to see an 8.6 billion dollar boost in sales for cattle and calves, hogs, and broilers. That would be a 5% increase from last year's sales. Now, the big ticket change in receipts, though, would be a drop in direct government payments, as said, from $46 billion in 2020 to $25.5 billion this year. That's a $21 billion decline, or 45% lower than last year. Most of that because of lower expected supplemental and ad hoc aid for farmers and ranchers tied to the pandemic. And farm sector expenses, says the USDA, also expected to increase $8.6 billion here in 21, up about 2.5% from last year's levels. Labor expenses to increase 4.6%, fertilizer and related expenses to increase $1.4 billion or 6% from 2020. And livestock and poultry expenses expected to increase by a $1 billion, about 3.5% for the year. Fuel expenses expected to increase. $800 million, about 7% for the year. Now, those numbers from the U.S. Census Bureau on Friday show a record $161 billion in U.S. agricultural export sales for 2020. That topped the $159 billion in sales reached in 2018. Globally, soybeans accounting for $25.5 billion in agricultural exports, corn exports just over $9.2 billion last year, and wheat exports amounting to $6.3 billion. U.S. pork exports topping $7.7 billion last year. Year that was up nearly 10 percent from 2019 sales. Exports of beef and beef products at 7.6 billion, down about 440 million. That marks two consecutive years of declining beef exports. Dairy exports were at 6.4 billion, up 8 percent from 2020. For the Phase One agreement with China, agricultural exports reached a record 28.7 billion dollars, up 43 percent from 2019 sales. That agreement, which was signed last January by then-President Donald Trump, had called for China to buy $36.5 billion in agricultural products in the first year of the agreement. Now, among the agricultural sales to China, according to this new data, soybeans accounting for $14 billion, about 49% of the total sales, pork sales accounting for $2.2 billion, cotton sales $1.8 billion, corn sales also reaching $1.2 billion, wheat sales $578 million to China, beef sales were $310 million. The current general sign-up period for acreage under the Conservation Reserve Program has now been extended past its original deadline. The USDA's Rod Bain has more on that. Landowners considering enrollment of acres in the current general sign-up of USDA's Conservation Reserve Program, please take note. General CRP sign-up is extended until further notice. 
That from Farm Service Agency Acting Administrator Steve Peterson. The original sign-up deadline for general CRP was set for February 12th. The sign-up extension comes as the new administration looks at ways to increase acreage enrollment. Currently, almost 21 million acres are enrolled in CRP versus an enrollment cap of 25 million acres per the 2018 Farm Bill. There are some discretionary items that the secretary makes decisions on, and so they wanted to give him the opportunity to do that. And for landowners with acres already under contract through this general CRP sign-up. We want to reassure producers that if changes are announced, that they will have the opportunity to come back and amend their contract based on those new provisions within the sign-up period. More information on CRP is available through local farm service agency offices. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. And the Environmental Protection Agency has extended the public comment period by 30 days for chlorpyrifos's proposed interim registration decision and the risk assessment underpinning that. The comment period was set to expire last Friday. Comments can now be submitted through March the 7th. The EPA released its interim registration decision for the insecticide in December of last year, following its release of a draft risk assessment back in September. The Biden administration is now re- Reviewing EPA regulatory actions from the past four years, including the chlorpyrifos registration review. In the interim registration decision, the EPA had proposed labeling amendments to limit applications associated with drinking water risks, as well as requiring additional personnel protection equipment and application restrictions to address handler risks. The agency also proposed spray drift mitigation, in addition to use limitations and application restrictions to reduce the exposure to off-target organisms. Chlorpyrifos is the main ingredient in what Dow AgroSciences and now Corteva's Lorsban insecticide contains. Chlorpyrifos and organophosphate insecticide used in a broad range of crops, including corn, alfalfa, cotton, wheat, and soybeans. It targets a number of insects, aphids, armyworms, cutworms, bean leaf beetles, rootworms, and spider mites among them. Corteva announced back in February of last year it was phasing out production of chlorpyrifos. The company citing falling demand for the product in the U.S. as the primary reason for that decision. Nonetheless, the EPA forged ahead with its re-registration of chlorpyrifos, ensuring the generic formulations of the chemical could remain legal to use in the year's to come. Now we'll take one final break, and when we come back, Jeff Wickman has this week's 4-H segment. He'll be talking with a K-State 4-H specialist about a special event helping youth learn more about the legislative process. You're tuned to Agriculture Today. Did you eat today? Thank a farmer. A way to get more involved in agriculture is through 4-H and FFA. Through 4-H and FFA, we have been given multiple opportunities to grow as leaders and learn more about agriculture. You can learn skills related to jobs, public speaking skills, and you get the opportunity to travel around the country and meet new people. If you want more information about getting more involved in 4-H and FFA, visit them on their websites at kansasffa.org and kansas4h.org. Welcome back to Agriculture Today. Along with Eric Atkinson, I'm Jeff Wickman. Kansas youth interested in learning about the legislative process with an emphasis on deliberation and finding common ground will be participating in Citizenship in Action this coming Sunday and Monday. Kansas 4-H Extension Communication Specialist Aliyah Mestrovich C. says the virtual event includes guest speakers as well as group discussions to train youth to facilitate community conversations. Aliyah Citizenship in Action is coming up virtually February 14th and 15th, and there is a lot on the plate, and a lot of this has to do with youth training youth in terms of conflict resolution and civil discourse. Yes, we've got a great program um, this year. It is being offered virtually. And one new element to the program this year is youth training other youth. And that's really a, a capstone moment for us because we haven't done this before. And so youth that have already learned facilitation skills are going to really take their level of mastery to a new level by being able to impact other youth and teach them facilitation skills as well. So cover how the youth are originally trained and then how they will work their training in to help others. Youth facilitators learn about how to be 
an effective facilitator, they first learn the difference between deliberation and dialogue and debate, which involves coming together. Deliberation happens when people carefully examine options and compare trade-offs before making a decision. So it's a very collective way of finding the common good, which means there's going to be some trade-offs too. So they learn that, they learn about the principles of civic discourse from the Institute for Civic Discourse and Democracy, and then they're basically going to be able to learn how to go through the different steps of the National Issues Forum curricula to be able to facilitate with other youth. And so that involves setting ground rules, having introductions, introducing the different options for the National Issues Forum, and coming to some type of consensus and common ground. And the youth themselves decided on the topics, and they've picked a couple of current topics that are difficult topics, policing and a house divided dealing with politics. That's right. And I I can see how these two topics kind of go hand in hand because these are two very salient issues that are impacting our world today. And the youth were provided with a variety of topics and the Kansas Youth Council voted and that's what they came up with. Tell me how this will work then in terms of citizenship in action. Will you go through the training process first or do you just jump right into the issues? First, after uh, youth facilitators have been trained and they've gotten a refresher, because we have a, a critical mass of youth facilitators across the state, they will then work with new youth facilitators in training to teach them how to be an effective facilitator. One of the things that we cover is something called the facilitator fast five. This is something that youth can reference while they are facilitating and in facilitating mode. And that involves being neutral, friendly, inclusive, helpful, and respectful. And if there's one thing I know about 4-H youth, they are extremely helpful and respectful and friendly people. So we actually dive deeper into what neutrality means and what it means to be inclusive and bring all voices to the table so that we can make sure that everybody is heard regardless of their background. Might be difficult to sum up in just a few words, but what is neutrality? Neutrality is a way to start off a deliberation and dialogue with a clean slate. So we prep the youth to make sure that their nonverbal body language remains neutral. We make sure that they do not interject their opinions or thoughts, because if they do, then that could really alter how the participants show up in that deliberation. So neutrality is the foundational piece of being an effective facilitator. So all of this really designed to make this youth friendly. That's correct. Yes. You know, when we get into topics like policing, we really need to make sure that it is developmentally appropriate and that youth are able to put into their own words the different options that they're going to be deliberating on. For example, when we talk about policing, you know, what should we do to ensure equal justice and fair treatment in our communities? There are three different options those youth are going to go through. One is, on one end of the spectrum, increasing accountability. And so when we look at that and we we begin to unpack that, We really want to make sure that when we're training youth to facilitate, that they can put that into their own words and make it their own so that it's developmentally appropriate. They will introduce the three different options. One is increasing accountability in our communities. The second one is confronting persistent racial discrimination in policing. And the third one is de-escalating to create new responses to nonviolent problems. So It's very possible that the group may choose one option, a variety of those three options, like a hybrid, or they may choose a completely different option that hasn't even been talked about yet. What we love about this particular curriculum is the Kettering Foundation is asking for feedback in our local communities. So once the youth have done this, they're going to be able to provide feedback to the entity that created this issue guide. So are you there then to guide them through the process, or is this totally up to the youth facilitators? Once they are in the room, well, the Zoom room, (laughs) once they're in the Zoom room, it will be up to them to lead the discussion and facilitate, and adults uh, will be there because, you know, we need to have too deep adult leadership, but we will be there as observers to support the process, but it'll be them to lead it. And because this is being done virtually, you will be bringing together youth from all across Kansas. Yes, we're hoping to have a great turnout. 
we're hoping that because it's, it's being offered online, that that will actually increase accessibility to youth that may not have been able to travel across the state or pay hundreds of dollars to be able to go and stay at the Capitol. So we're going to have some great guest speakers, some wonderful leaders across our state, and this will be a time for youth voice to be at the forefront of these conversations to show Kansas how youth can be agents of change. Well, that's really part of the process here, isn't it, is opening them up to the idea that they can have voices within their communities and they can be a change agent if they want to be? Yes, and I would say one other thing, Jeff. We really need to look to our youth to be able to better understand how we can practice humility and depolarization during an increasingly difficult time. People have pandemic fatigue right now. You know, with the new year comes new expectations, and it's taking a while for our society to get back to where it needs to be in terms of just being healthy, right? So this is an opportunity for us as adults to look to youth and be able to see how they are making meaning of this and being agents of change and peacemakers in our communities. That's Kansas 4-H Extension Communication Specialist, Aliyah Mestrovich C. With an overview of this year's Citizenship in Action being held virtually February 14th and 15th. And that'll do it for this edition of Agriculture Today. For Eric Atkinson, I'm Jeff Wickman. This is the K-State Radio Network.